so uh, we're here today in uh, the little shack with Gary Dassing of Mentalo and the Fixer, uh, and we're here to uh, talk a little bit about how Gary got into what he does, his music, why he started it, what he thinks about what's going on in the music scene today. Um, so, just to start off, Gary, uh, what what did what was what were some of your first experiences with music? Did what made you decide you wanted to be a musician? I think it was um, probably since I was a kid, just being in my sister's room, uh, seeing all the pictures on her wall, constantly playing music on her stereo. This is during the seventies. Um, and just being fascinated by the music she'd play me at the time. It was a lot of prog rock um, and rock, and then, you know, early, early new wave and punk. So, being somebody who was around four or five, I was fascinated by all these pictures on her wall, um, just covered wall to wall, you know, seeing, you know, like the posters that come in Dark Side of the, Dark Side of the Moon LP, there are the pyramids and stuff, just stuff like that. I was, as a kid, you're going, Wow, this is like being in a carnival, except it's in, you know, it's in the door next door, you know, <laughs> two doors down, you know. So that that's initially what started everything, was just a fascination. I remember my sister playing uh, the beginning of Rush 21, 2112, you know, just the whole keyboard part, you know, it sounds spacey going off, and as a little kid, I think that came out in 76, I must have been five or six at the time, hearing that, playing full blast, sitting on her bed going... Wow, you know, that sounds cool, you know, play it again, play it again, play it again, you know. Were, were uh, synthesizers ba really available in 76, you know? Or... Well, I'm sure they were, but, I mean, you had to, they were costly, I and mean, something you'd only run across in studios. Well, or... What were some of your first synthesizers? Well, I think the first two were, it was a Juno 6, and uh, a Sequential Circuits, uh uh, multi-track mm -hmm. and then uh, we got the tom drum machine and that must have been in 83 82 or 83 and when you say I, obviously this is you and Dwayne we're yeah, still right we're because when when the group got together and so the group has gone through changes right it wasn't always mentality and the fixer it was yeah i mean there's just been so many incarnations along the way with things Dwayne and i have done from from the very beginning you know i mean you know, there was Benestrophy, and then there's a lot of pre-Benestrophy stuff. Uh, you know, pretty much... How many albums did, did you end up publishing as Mentello and the Fixer? God, I don't know. Was it, it, there was at least... At least ten, At I'm least thinking. ten. Yeah. At least ten, so... Um, ten or twelve, something like that. Um, Mostly through the 90s. Right, right. Mostly through the 90s, I recall. Um... What would you consider your first measure of success as a band? Hmm. I guess getting that first royalty check and being able to spend it all on equipment because we were, you know, equipment addicts at the time. It's what our money was going to was simply equipment. We wanted to build our own Starship Enterprise. <laughs> you know, pretty much. That's what it was, you know? I guess, I guess that was the... I, or it wasn't even that. It was actually getting... Probably getting my first CD, you know, Rest for the Wicked, in my hand. And the vinyl copy going... Wow. Wow. Yeah, this is cool. You know, I'm just some kid in Texas. So, so speaking of... Okay, so you were a kid in Texas. So what was the scene like back then? What? I think it was cool. It was underground, but it was cool. So Texas, San Antonio, Texas, cool. You know, uh, totally cool. Is a is not a synthesizer town, you know. No, but I think that's what you know. That's where the people got singled out, posers from the real people. Very, very much a rock town, you know. I remember. Very much a rock town, yeah. Very much on heavy metal, um, but. You know, the underground new waivers and, you know, everybody back then from punks to homosexuals hung out together because there were no divisions. You had to hang out together, mm -hmm. you know. 
as one big click to, to save each other because you're always getting publicly ridiculed. It, things like that don't happen today. And if they do, you no. don't, you know, compared to somebody calling, uh, today's terms, it's somebody calling you a name in public. That, that was pretty common back then compared to an ass beating back then. Right. So the, and that's that was kind of my next question. How do you think the scene has really changed from then Pe to now? People don't even people don't even know who forefathered the music or anything like that. Uh, it's all about image. Back then, you could look like a preppy, show up to a club. If you were into Cabaret Voltaire, you were into Cabaret Voltaire. It didn't matter how you looked. You know, you could be some. It just didn't matter back then. Image was not a thing. It was about the music and being underground. You know? It's not like that anymore. Uh, everything has cornered itself into a niche. You know? And, uh, I mean, you can't stop progress. You know? It's not underground anymore. I mean, by God, the internet destroyed that and more. You know? I mean... But, I mean, hey, those were the glory days, you know? So, um, do you think that, so, talking about the internet, right, so do, does that, how do you feel about distribution and the way that it was done when you first started and then kind of towards the middle of your career as opposed to now, you know? Well, I, you just roll with the punches. You know, I'm just thankful I got to release one CD. I mean, I have a label releasing box sets of mine, and it's funny because I see people nagging about it on the internet, you know? I'm not doing it for money. I'm doing it for my own self-ego. Right. You know, I can sit back and go, wow, I've got my whole life dictionary here in music. It's like a photo album. Do you have that? And somebody, I didn't have to pay for a thing, and it looks <laughs> professional. Somebody said, what's a money grab? What money? Are you serious? Come on, get real. So the internet has has destroyed making money off of well, making music. That. I guess it has to a, a great degree, but you shouldn't do it for the money. You should do it simply for the love of it. What underground musician really strived to break into the, the pop world? Did they really think they were going to eke a living out of it? If you were able to buy a keyboard or two out of it, then you should be happy. And if not, you could spend it on getting your electric state on, you know? Well, you know, and there are a lot of bands, you'll see a lot of bands that are coming around and doing uh, re-release tours or, That's you know, fine. come back together tours or, you know, and then there's a lot of bands who are out there who probably shouldn't have had more than one or two tours and who are on their 10th or 15th tour. Uh, is that kind of what you're talking about? These, these are these the kind of people who are looking to make an image, or God, make I don't know. make, make I mean, some kind of. I know. That's... By God, look at the people I'm hanging out with. <laughs> now that's industrial. 